I'd like to call the Wednesday meeting of the Kansas State Board of Education uh, together. Please notice that uh, all members are present. Uh, I have been asked by our secretary, who uh, executive secretary, who is a person of whom I fear, uh, to, uh, to, to consider going ahead and making the calendar decision now because so many other people are uh, based their calendars on our calendar and i've been advised by our attorney that the best way to do that is to actually have a motion to uh, amend the agenda to include that item uh, if that if that if there's a motion and a second for the amendment then we will vote on that and if it passes then we will vote to approve the the agenda as amended and I would suggest that that item be number 3a and would be considered immediately after the approval of the agenda Jean okay is there a second uh, Betty seconds it and Ben you get to make the motion <laughs> the letter Okay, all in favor of the amendment, and this is adding, this is to add the, dis, discuss, the action on the changing of the, of the November date. Uh, please raise your hand. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. At this point, a motion will be in order to approve the agenda as amended. Dean and Jean, all in favor? All opposed? Ben. Uh, do we need to suspend the rules? Temporarily suspend the rules. Okay. 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 I move that we temporarily suspend the rules and do everything that Mark Ferguson said. Is there a second to that? I hate to give blanket to Mark. Uh, it's, uh, you, you never want to do card It was mods. past tense said, not what he's going to say. You never want to give card blanket to lawyers, you know. <laughs> Dina, is that a second? All in favor? Oh, that was most. Now you may make the motion. And then I move that we move the November 2022 meeting to the afternoon of November 9th. Is that correct? I don't have my calendar in front of me. Uh, November 9th yes. and all day November 10th. So it'll be a Wednesday afternoon and all day Thursday. Is there a second to that motion? Mel Melanie seconds that motion. Ninth and tenth. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. I've asked uh, Craig to talk about remote learning. And uh, the legislative liaison people have threatened me with it for, for giving you some of their time. So uh, please take less than an hour. <laughs> In that time frame. Peggy's giving you some information, uh, two pieces of, of information. One is the actual language from the bill dealing with remote learning, which is House Bill 2134. It's uh, quite a few pages, the full bill, so we just pulled out the section that deals with remote learning. Um, and then you're also going to receive the slides that are about to be up in front of you, which is a shortened version uh, that I think hits most of the high points. So the Legislature passed House Bill 2134. That was the bill that contained most of the items that dealt with education, including our, our funding. One of them was remote learning, and it defined remote learning. Uh, just to, to back up a little bit, prior to last year, I don't know that we ever even used the term remote learning, much less had it take place. But with the pandemic, and students and parents who felt safer staying home, that became a common way to educate students. So to help clarify the difference between remote learning and virtual schools, they included this definition in the bill. And, and to try and be clear, the legislature is fine with virtual schools. If students and parents are not comfortable attending school this year, uh, the option that would be available would still be virtual schools uh, to attend virtually. But remote learning, as it's described here, and the, and the main issues are 
regularly enrolled in the district. They do not physically attend the attendance center. Last year that typically meant they learned from home uh, on a full-time basis. Curriculum and instruction prepared, provided, and supervised by the teachers and staff of the school district. Some virtual schools are done that way, but not all by any means. But in remote learning, that's the way it always happened. The teachers of the school district, and in some cases schools uh, had so many students they hired additional staff, but it was their teachers providing the curriculum of the school district, and the intention was to approximate the learning experience that takes place in the classroom. Again, some virtual schools that happens, but not all. Some provided a totally different curriculum and a different experience. But remote learning, as we experienced it last year, is what they were trying to define. So given that definition, school districts may not provide more than 40 hours to any student. Uh, and that's just flatly stated in the bill. There are exceptions. The local board can exempt a student due to illness, medical condition, injury, or extraordinary circumstance. So the student uh, that uh, needs to have surgery or is in an accident and has a broken leg and will need to stay home for three weeks, the local board can grant an exemption so that the school can provide remote learning if that's the best way for that student to be taught uh, for more than 40 hours. And I might back up. The 40 hours was picked because that's more or less a week for most school districts. Uh, and the intention was that allows the school district to provide remote learning to their students if they choose to. If you have a snowstorm that lasts for several days, if you have a gas leak and have to close your building, those types of issues that occur from time to time. They didn't want to rule that out as possibly uh, a better way to provide education than just sending homework home, for instance. So that is an option in those types of situations. That's why the 40 hours was allowed in there. The exemption was for those situations that typically happen. Since the uh, virus has flared up again, obviously if a student tests positive for COVID, that's an illness, a medical condition. If they have to stay home, the board could, the local board can exempt that student from the 40 hour count. And you can provide remote learning if that's the best option for that student for as long as they are uh, quarantined at home. Which brings up the next question we're getting from school districts. Craig tests positive for COVID. So he's staying at home, he's got an illness, we can exempt him. How about uh, seven of Craig's classmates that now have to be quarantined because they were close contacts? We believe that falls under extraordinary circumstance and that the board could also exempt those students that had to be quarantined. Yes, sir. I got a call yesterday from a, from a parent that had an 11 year old child that had a serious heart condition mm -hmm. that, uh, and, and had numerous surgeries uh, and had been you know, even Boston General where, and, and believed that, uh, that if the child contracted and probably legitimately believed that if the child contracted COVID, it would probably be fatal. Can that child then be exempted and taught at home all year? Uh, in, in my opinion, yes, under the medical condition exemption. Uh, the, the, the intention... Does the school have to do it? No. Uh, well, back up. That depends, and I'll just jump ahead, on the three letters at the bottom of this slide. If the child has an IEP that says that's the least restrictive environment, staying home, then yes, the, the school has to do it. But barring that, um, you do not have to, just because the student needs to be at home, doesn't mean you have to provide what's defined as remote learning. There may be another method that works best. We used to have home, homebound instruction, still do. Uh, we're trying not to use that term too much because that has some special connotations in the world of special education about specifically what's going to happen. Uh, that does not always involve a teacher making contact. Uh, remote learning does. So, 
Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the event of students being exempted from the 40 hours, the local district is required to notify the state board that, that these students have been exempted. Because the, another question we get is, okay, how, how does the board exempt them? They have to specifically exempt them, it's our understanding, uh, with a motion in a board meeting. Now, because of the circumstances, you're not going to name that student. You're not going to have your public motion say, Craig is exempted because he has COVID. Uh, so the local board is probably going to do it by reference to a list or on the consent agenda. But there will be a list maintained, and the district must notify the state board of who those students were that were exempted. Any questions about that piece of it? Okay, the state board also has a role to play. Um, you may authorize up to 240 hours of remote learning due to a disaster that might occur in the district. So think tornado, flood, those kinds of issues that would close a building for a long term. If they cannot reasonably make up that time, the district may apply to you for permission to provide remote learning for an extended period of time. And that is specifically, in the handout that has the full uh, wording, that is uh, just below the middle of the first page, letter D, if you want to read specifically what it says about your role in that. Any questions? Janet? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have a couple. The first question is, I was contacted by an individual who was not comfortable sending their children back to school full time and they wanted them to go remote. Mm -hmm. And I replied that they would have to go virtual. Is that correct or could they, could they because they're just not, they're just, they're just not comfortable with it. Right, that is correct. Unless they meet one of those exemptions listed there, then the option is to attend virtual school. Okay, and my second question is this. Uh, last year when I was with Randy when we were visiting schools when they were trying to open everything back up. Several districts commented, well, maybe now on snow days mm -hmm. we could have remote. Can we do that? Yes, uh, and that is partially the purpose of the 40 hours that's allowed. Uh, so if as a district you choose to provide remote learning during snow days, during gas leaks, during whatever the case might be that your building has to close, that is allowable as long as you don't pass 40 hours. Thank you. This is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is kind of general uh, question because um, my concern is that the public and obviously a number of school boards have no idea how this mm -hmm. is structured. Um, the feedback I've received is that the state board is the one that denied um, remote learning. Um, and so there's a great deal of misinformation out there. Uh -huh. So my concern is, um, is it the responsibility of the legislature to make sure uh, the public is aware of, of what was done and, and the procedure that they are to follow? How is this information disseminated to the public? so they understand what the procedures are. Um, part of this is opinion. Part of it is I'll tell you what we did. Uh, opinion, notifying the public probably happens best the closer you are to them. Uh, what we did during our budget workshops this summer as well as during the Zooms that we have, used to be weekly, now monthly with superintendents, we shared this PowerPoint that you're seeing, those slides, as well as other information. So to, to make superintendents aware of it. Um, yesterday or Monday, I don't remember which day, we sent the exact language from the bill to superintendents as well. So they would have that. So we've shared it with all the school districts. Um, I'm not sure, uh, again, I think it's best shared with the public then by the local school district because they can better describe what it means in their district. So is there a mapped out procedure that a parent would follow um, um, 
where they would know, uh, do I set up a meeting with the local board? Do I go through the superintendent? How do I initiate any of this? I mean, um, it's, it's kind of like telling a person who's unfamiliar with the computer, open your browser. Yeah, good point. We will provide for school districts a specific form that they can use to notify the state board so they'll know how that piece of it works. For parents, um, and I, I can't speak for a local school district, but I believe most districts are going to want them to start with their, the principal in their building like you would with any other issue or concern uh, that has to do with attendance. Because when it finally comes down to it, that's what we're talking about is attendance in the school. And final question, and so typically when the school board uh, makes, local boards make a decision regarding a student, um, if that parent disagrees, there is an appeal process. Is, is anything set up where um, if the local board, as an extreme example, say, well, no, where that parent can appeal that, or is that the final say? I don't know of anything in the bill that allows an appeal process. My hand raising thing apparently is not working. So if you have questions, you have to let hand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Craig, if they did use um, a snow day as a remote day, uh -huh. don't they have to deliver meals on that day? Isn't there a requirement about that? There is a requirement to deliver meals unless the weather is so bad that the district determines it's not safe to do oh, that. Okay. Then they're okay. allowed not to. I have in your visits with the superintendents has this come up about I mean I know almost all of them that I know of made some arrangements to have a virtual option available this year even if they hadn't in the past because nobody wants to do remote I don't know a single teacher wants to do remote again and I don't know any districts who really want their teachers to have to deal with all that because we run into the problems we talked about yesterday you know but are the superintendents, um, I mean, are they getting concerned about that or is the virtual option look like it's gonna work for them? I don't wanna speak for them, but I think, uh, like you said, most of them made arrangements uh -huh. if they didn't have it already uh, to have a virtual option specifically for that reason. So okay. they, they evidently believe that it will work for them. So if the parents said, yeah, I'm just not comfortable, then okay, here's your virtual option. Yes. That's what we've got. Okay, good. Thank you. Brad. Brad. Since virtual's on our team, we have had quite an increase. And because you can't just start a virtual option, you have to apply, you have to provide assurances. Yeah. So we had quite a few districts went through that process last year. Mm -hmm. But in addition, um, some of our service centers changed the way they do mm -hmm. virtual for their member districts. And many of them worked with school districts to say, you know, you sign the assurances that your teachers or your counselors will provide supports during the week, and then we will provide the instruction during the week. So they, they made a lot of changes to their mm. virtual programs based on what they learned from remote learning, yeah. the positives. So there, so there was a lot of work over the last year in the event that we needed. Right. So I think many of them are in place for that. Good. Well, I remember Probably they- not all, but a lot more than the year prior. Remember they all had to sign up by some date in February and I kept pushing, I go, even if you don't know, go sign up so you have that option because you don't want to be stuck with no option for kids. So, and I know Greenbush went with a new vendor, Florida, um, Something I can't think of what it was, but there. But the school district can still provide their own counselors to go along with the virtual. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So Greenbush, for example, hired content-specific teachers. So uh, instead of a student being assigned one teacher for five contents. The student's going to get someone licensed mm. to teach each content. And then the school district signed an assurance that they would provide the counseling, 
uh, all of the services that they do locally, they will continue that as part of um, the agreement to do it because we learned in remote, the more the student can stay connected with their peers, their local counselors, social workers, and, right. and Greenbush, for example, is providing the content. And if they do that, they get, what, 5,000 a kid now? Is that what well, virtual? Well, it will still be counted as a, the kid will be counted as virtual, right. not as a brick and mortar. Gotcha. Yeah, that's okay. On the next slide. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Just a quick, quick clarification. So we're, the, uh, if, it's my understanding that the school districts are not going like a, in a quarantine or an isolation um, incident where they've, they've, you've tested positive or been near someone. Do they still have to prove and have that 72-hour hearing through the Department of Health to, 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 to quarantine you at your house? Or, since the districts aren't going to be dealing with that, the Department of Health will be. You, yes, you used to have that 72-hour hearing and they had to provide you with that to prove that you you can't bring your kid back to school and, and, um, and be educated, that you have to stay home and, and learn remote or whatever it is right. you have to do. I'm not aware that that requirement is still there. Okay. And are the, uh, as far as the, like the case rules, are they able, on, on, on virtual, are they able to, to uh, with sports and stuff within, within the district, since you're like inside or like with Spring Hill, they're able to be right. within that dist district, are they able to participate in sports? Somebody here may know the Casey regulations better than I do, but uh, I believe you had to be enrolled at least one class brick and mortar to be eligible. That may be different now. I don't know. I wonder if that really changed. No way. Not anymore? I don't, I don't know if that's so Oh, okay. So how do, we, how do we need to find that out to get that out to the public in case they ask that question? Uh, Keisha would have to provide that to the school districts. Okay. I got a message yesterday from Keisha. I'm sure they're a lot like school districts were. They didn't think they'd be back in this position again this year, and so they may be re-examining. Okay, let's move on. Just finally, um, one of the issues that, that uh, legislators deal with is, so we pass a law and says you can't do this, what happens if you do? So they included, if for some reason a student would exceed 40 hours without an exemption, they are no longer con considered and funded as a brick and mortar student. They're funded as a remote learner, which is $5,000. That's the same amount as a full-time virtual student is funded at. Uh, there is no part-time funding for virtual students. So if a student would be part-time, I'm sorry, no part-time funding for remote learning students. There is for virtual. So if a student would be part-time remote and part-time brick and mortar, they're funded for the part-time that's brick and mortar and no funding is provided for the part-time that's remote. So if a student would exceed, and just for clarification, part-time remote is uh, another term for that was hybrid. So there will be very few, if any, hybrid students this year, and that was the intention. We specifically asked about that. They did not want to allow hybrid learning. And then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, an IEP is federal law, and that prevails. So if the student's IEP says the least restrictive environment is home or this other learning setting that's outside of school and providing remote learning is the best way to do it, uh, that will be allowed and they will not be penalized on the funding. Okay, I see no further questions and you've answered the question. You've answered. Jean? I just had a question. Um, this bill has a lot of um, uh, state board shall do this uh, determination or waive that. Well, can you explain? Just briefly explain how the department's manning, man, going to manage the, those requests and, and how we will interact with them. The request for the 240 hours? Well, um, it appears so, or the it, learning in excess of the 40 hour limitation. There's a lot of okay. requests for the state board to do various things. So the. Um, and go back up one. 
informing the state board uh, that the, of the students that have been exempted. We'll have a form that districts will be able to complete and send in to us so that you can be notified this many students were exempted in Oskaloosa, whatever the district might be. Uh, so that will take place by uh, way of a, a form that will be turned into us. The 240 hours exemption will have to come as a request from the local board to the state board. We've had this event that's occurred. We can't uh, use our facilities for an extended period of time. Uh, here's the reason and why we cannot reasonably make up that time. So they would make a, re a specific request to the state board as an individual district. The other thing that's mentioned in there is those students that do exceed 40 hours and don't have an exemption, if there are any, uh, that would need to be funded at $5,000. The districts report that to us in June. We have a, uh, another report called the Local Effort Form that already comes in in June that contains information about uh, virtual students, for instance. That will be added to that report so that they can report it to us and we will adjust funding at that time. And so those um, requests will come to us for approval? Uh, those are not really approval. Those are just telling uh, the state board and us these students exceeded 40 hours. We have to adjust their funding, and then because it's June, the following year when the auditors go out, we will audit those numbers to ensure that that is what really happened. So the department will be taking those actions where it says the state board shall notify or the state board shall determine that type of thing? Uh, yes, with the exception of the 240 hours. The state board has to approve that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I will turn the... Uh, Floor over to our legislative liaisons to discuss our legisl proposed legislative agenda. I want to thank them for putting together a draft that we will now be uh, discussing. So, Nina, Ben. The handout should be in your folder. Yeah, it's toward the back, I think. Right, Peggy? We did include a statement uh, at the beginning and uh, if you feel that something else ought to be included there, uh, certainly would like your input on that. Um, one thing I noticed, the first sentence talks about um, our constitutional authority, and one of the other things that we mention later is licensure of educators, and I think maybe we ought to include that. So that first statement would say, the Kansas State Board of Education has the constitutional authority for general supervision of public schools, which includes setting course standards, determining high, high school graduation requirements, and licensure of educators, pre-K uh, pre through 12 educators. So, um, and then another thing that I'd like to do is in that last statement some way, if we could, um, it, bothers me that we keep saying support, support, supports as we read through this. So um, if you'll grant us um, technical changes, we um, can, I think, fix it. So it says that 
the state board supports, and then we just use bullet points instead of always saying supports. Um, and if anyone, if no one has specific things at the moment they'd like to add to the statement, we'll start moving on through the, the actual uh, priorities that we've identified. Let me just make an observation. You know, we, we sort of fight with the legislature every year over what their responsibility is and what our responsibility is. I think tone is important. I, I don't object to anything that's said here, but I would like to lead. I, I think it would be to our advantage to lead with the statement about wanting to cooperate with the legislature. Okay. So that the first thing they don't, the first thing they don't see is kind of rub it in your face. This is our, I agree with everything is there. Uh, but I think that if the audience is the legislature and we want to continually reach out for cooperation, uh, that it might be to our advantage to lead with that statement and reinforce it. So instead of that's just Leading not, with I'm, I'm constitutional authority, uh, you would like for us to take the second sentence and move uh, it to well, the first well, sentence. Yeah, uh, and I, I think I, we I'd could like also cooperation. You know, that and we could also, I think, say there that we appreciate the fact that they've made efforts to meet the the Supreme Court's agreement. Anything, as well, so. Anything that we say positive will be to our long-term advantage, in my opinion. So, Jim, are you suggesting they just move that one sentence that says it's our desire to work in concert, maybe make that the opening sentence? Yes, and uh, let's see. Which? It's the third sentence. The third sentence. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's our desire to work in concert with the legislature. That, and I would take so that rather than in opposition. Take, take both of those and move them I to the first. I, you know, if I were doing it, uh, and I'm not, uh, so, but I would just simply want to lead with, it is our desire to work in concert with the legislature to improve and, and even take out the word rather than in opposition. Uh, I, would, I would try to be as positive as possible to start. And that's, I mean, that's a picky little issue, but I think, I think tone's important. Okay. And by the way, everybody else is in this, not just me, so Jean. Certainly. I, on that, I, I agree that leading with that third sentence would be helpful at, and taking out rather than in opposition. Also, in the sentence before that one, I would take out before developing legislation um, and just putting the period after the word education because that it, it eliminates the negative and I know that's really what we would like them to do but I, I hate to cause an affront right at the outset of this. You have that down. Well, I, anybody else have opinions on that? Anybody in agreement? Okay. This is your guys' statement. We just gave you a draft. <laughs> well, and, and I appreciate that because if we didn't have a draft, we'd be wordsmithing and we'd be here mm -hmm. until Friday. <laughs> I know. And some people may want to go home for that. Uh, but I, but I just, you know, in my, you guys have been a lot more successful as legislative liaison than I was. But I always found leading with positives was better, even though it regularly did not. Well, it's always good to compliment before you say anything else. <laughs> um, are we ready to move on to the specific areas? Okay, academic support efforts. If, um, I want to add, if you've noticed, uh, this is a big picture item. As you recall, last year, last couple of years, there have been just a long series. And meeting with our, our educational partners, some of them in the room, 
Um, we are looking at drafting these and how our board priorities are in terms of our accreditation and everything else. So as you notice, we talk about academic, social, emotional, health and safety, those things. And so they're organized in that way. Uh, so it wasn't just a long list of random things just compiled together. They were, they were capsulized, but they also reflect some of the board goals and the goals of KSDE for messaging beyond just these, but also when we deal with legislature to say, hey, what are these? These are priorities from the state board uh, to our school. So it's a big change in the way that they're organized compared to the last previous years. And that, I have to give credit to some of our partners on that deal. Well, and it also, uh, from my point of view, when I looked at it, it was um, things were all over the place, so to speak. There wasn't much organization. So um, one of the things that we tried to do was to do, as, as Ben said, pull out specific things and categorize these areas. So the first one, we it was suggested that we kind of re rewrite that sentence that we had about supporting uh, the things that the legislative task force on dyslexia had already said, because much of it we had already put in place. And really the, the item that's missing is providing the funding for the dyslexia focus position at KSDE. So uh, it was suggested we just period say that. And uh, so we did change that sentence a little bit. Any comments regarding that? It's Michelle. The dyslexic coordinator position, I was. Uh, when we when we met last month, I thought that came out of general fund. Correct? Is that correct? The coordinator position. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. Did that come out? Go okay. ahead. And then we just want the legislator to continue to fund that, or is that what we're? Did it come out of general fund or COVID? Like okay. Brad, do you want to address so what the she's asking? So the task force for the last few years recommended that the state appropriate to us general fund dollars to fund that position. But they haven't yet. They have not yet. And it hasn't been specifically appropriated yet, so. So when that, if that person gets, that, that has been posted that position, if they get hired, it'll come out of reserves then or will it come out of like the ESSER funds, funding right for right now? Or how right now we, we have some vacancies that we're going to try and cover that. Okay. But we would like to ask for it because then we could fill other ones that are currently vacant. Okay. Just want to make that clear. Yep. Okay. The, uh, the Dyslexia Task Force made numerous recommendations, some of them to us, and then several funding recommendations to the legislature. Every recommendation made to us has been done even though we don't have a coordinator we've had other people take over those responsibilities so we have those zero funding recommendations have been funded however through ESSER funds we are now doing the training like the letters training from yesterday that we talked about yesterday so we're actually through ESSER funding covering the things we've asked the legislature to do however when that's gone uh, We'll still need additional funding from the legislature for those for those purposes, and that's the, the dyslexia task force requested specifically requested, and it was unanimous. And the person that made the the motion for the dyslexia coordinator to be funded is the current president of the Senate. So we have that sort of support uh, uh, at that level. Anyone else? Anyone else have questions or comments about the first statement? Okay, moving on. 
supports the goal of moving the first 15 post-secondary credit hours tuition free during high school. And that's been something that even some legislators would like to see. Funding has maybe been an issue there, but um, at any rate, we, Ben and I, thought that was an important uh, goal for us to work toward. Well, and it does fit well with the, with our, uh, you know, plans, individual plans of study. Uh, it, it helps facilitate that. I think that's something, even though I don't think that's on the goals now, the Board of Regents, it was in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still something that I think uh, that, that, that appeals to a lot of legislators. And then did you have something you added? It, well, it came, from, it came from Bert. Um, uh, we also talked to uh, SEAC, and, and Jim might be able to talk about this, but there was a request for the authority to use funding to provide an extra year of services to SPED kids. Uh, to increase the age to um, was it 23, uh, temporarily, just to address COVID learning loss for SPED kids, or 22, sorry, it's 21 now, mm -hmm. to expand another year um, to cover the ages of 22. Again, it's all COVID related um, because we have SPED kids in that transitional age range that did not get services or did not get um, Do they have? That, that came from Bert at in the SPED. They can provide the service, they just can't be funded. Mm -hmm. So it was it was authorizing funds to be used. It kind of goes in both the funding and the academic. I like to put in the academic because it's more academic based uh, in terms of just authorizing the money to be used to. And that came as a request from SEAC um, and their messages to us. So. Um, if there isn't, it's not typed on there, but uh, it's, if it has a consensus to add it on there, we will. I could see he had it written on there, so yeah. I was giving yeah. him a chance to say what, what it was he had mm -hmm. in mind. But again, that would most likely be a funding an issue when it, we get to funding. I think it's an authorization more than it is additional funding. It's just an authorization to use funds because well, can they use funds for 22? It would inc it would increase the numbers of students. Okay. Not that it's not important because yeah. we do want our all of our students to. Um, be successful, as successful as they possibly can be. So um, from my point of view, that's particularly when COVID has made a kind of a, an issue for us to deal with there, that for that could be an exception for for the school districts or the uh, co-ops, whoever monitors the uh, special ed in any district to to deal, allow them to deal with it and uh, make certain their students are ready to to go out into the world. From a procedural issue, Jana? since I can't see people and you can, we won't go through the, and my, Hand holding thing is not working. Yeah. Just call on people as they raise their oh, hand. Oh, we will. They're all outspoken individuals anyway. But does it, Janet? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My question is this uh, if we do not get the legislative approval, then the special ed could not have the funding for that. Is that correct? Or they could not use the, the special ed funding for it if it's not yeah, approved the by the legislature? Or can they do it without approval by the legislature and fund it them by use? Okay, I want to make sure they 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 don't get 
they don't have to cut into their own budgets, I guess, is what I'm saying. Without additional funding, they would be cutting into their own budget. Um, okay. There will, there will be, there one question you can ask, since the reason this is necessary is COVID-related, Could they use that? They could use that with the ESSER funds, for example. Uh, that's my opinion. The task force would have to review that. But, uh, well, I okay. believe this is extremely important because from everything I've heard from everyone, our special ed kids have suffered the most for through COVID. They've lost the most, and it's going to be harder to catch them up. So, therefore, I support whatever needs to be done. So... Thank you. Well, at least we can make sure if we have that statement, we can mm -hmm. say we believe that that should be authorized. Brad. I just emailed Bert. When we know that over 80% of students with IEPs graduate in four years, I'm just going to try and get an estimate of how many go to 21 so we kind of get an idea because I don't think it's going to be a considerable number that would then need to also go on to so I'll try to get that this okay morning. that would be excellent information did I see a hand on this side Michelle yes thank you Dina I, um, I'm just going back um, um, to the to the moving toward the first 15 post-secondary credit hours. Is, is that something we're doing right now? Are, you, are we talking about concurrent enrollment where like you get those credit hours towards, um, you're kind of working with community colleges and we're getting, they're taking them in high school and they're, they're getting credit hours for certain classes if they qualify. Um, so a lot of times they have to be tested in. Is that what we're talking about or, or is it more for CTE or? Um, it, it would be the, the first 15 uh, general credit hours is generally what we were looking at. So we look like English comp, college algebra, those courses, and it's to have the state cover the cost of taking those courses. Because right now it depends district to district whether the district, some districts pay for it, some districts the parents pay all of it, some districts it's subsidized um, by an agreement. I mean, it's the... To keep, it, to keep it balanced throughout the state. Statewide, this yeah, is... Parents do pay for it. Parents do pay for quite a bit of that. Mm -hmm. districts pick Parents up. Mm -hmm. most likely yeah. pay for it. There, there was authority last year granted to yeah. school districts to cover the cost of some right. of that as well. CTE is covered under the old Senate Bill 155, and the, the regents get the money and they pay for that. What we were after was the other kids who are going gen ed you know other academic pursuits not cte that from all the and this we developed a bill with the board of regents three years ago to ask for the first 15 to be paid for those first like english one and two whatever college algebra whatever we had five classes we were targeting that we knew if we could get that done in high school, kids would have a better chance to finish. We had worked out a deal with the community colleges about how much you know compensation they would receive, and we took the bill to the legislature, and it got through the Senate, but not the House. So we're, it's really kind of reviving an idea that we had before. Um, and even if we couldn't get 15, you know, if we could get them to start with something like three or six, it would mean a whole lot to those first-generation kids who or kids who never thought they'd ever go to college. And it's so unfair that, like in Johnson County, it may be 100 bucks an hour, but great for kids whose parents have 100 bucks an hour to spend, but we have a whole lot of kids throughout the state who don't have that opportunity. So we wanted to make it equal for all kids that the first 15 would be provided, assuming you could pass you know, your ACT scores or whatever it would take, but that the first 15 would be provided free statewide. And, I, and it would be a, I mean, I can't even imagine how great that would be for the economy and, you know, attracting businesses, you know, all that too. But um, I really I really like trying to dredge this thing back up and, and get it moving again. And I know in our um, Advantage Kansas uh, committee, they're talking about uh, one of the Jumpstart team is working on, you know, how do we get more dual credit hours in high school? And 
they really like the idea of helping to pay for some of them too. And one of the, I remember when we were first talking about this also that uh, it was seen as a way of getting first generation students more um, confident that they could participate in a, on a college level. And um, so because we need a much larger pot, pool of individuals who are capable of, of fulfilling some positions. So it's another way of saying, hey, you, you can do this even though many do not believe that they can because their families have never ever been college graduates. So um, there's many reasons for reaching out into that arena. Based on consensus, do you support the academic standards which would be including the dyslexia task force, the uh, 15 hours, and the ad asking for the additional year of special education is mm -hmm. there. We're not gonna do motions, but as a consensus, do you agree with that or not? I just, I just need to get more information on that because there's a lot of, those. some of those courses are weed up. Weed up, I mean, there's a reason that they're, they have to be the certain competency. So I would say maybe we look, to, look yes. towards a competency because just because we're paying for our taxpayers or whoever's paying for that, you still have to be able to do the work and you still have to, you still have to put forth effort. You, you and, and, do and, um, have to meet certain great expe expectations and so on. The, the, the requirements for these courses will still be there. It's giving access. It's not requiring every kid to go through it either, and I don't think that's the intention of it, is that every kid will have it, but it's offering that to those students that that's the path they're going to go down. And otherwise qualify. A lot of yep. those are at community colleges. A lot of those courses are community colleges, mm -hmm. and it's, it's a lot lesser, uh, it's less expensive to go on to a univer big university mm -hmm. and try to take those courses. Yep. So a lot of people uh, go to their local community colleges and go through that, um, which is, it's, well, a, it's less. The plan for this is for them to all be at community colleges, yep. is my understanding. Let's move on. Yep. Okay, moving on to social and emotional issues. Support the ongoing work and recommendations of the School Mental Health Advisory Council, including but not limited to bullying prevention and efforts for suicide prevention and awareness. And we kind of combined a couple of, of uh, statements there was a separate one for bullying and, and suicide, so suicide prevention. So we combined those because the Mental Health Advisory Council had been the last group to, uh, to touch upon yeah, this that is... particular area. And it was suggested by... Uh, by our partners to add, but not limited to. So that's a little different from what our last uh, draft said, but doesn't change the meaning, just adds since, uh, the, the potential of something else. Since the legislature also has been interested in all sorts of abuse and neglect prevention, should that also be listed under not limited to? Should that be added? Because that, that does come up every session. You know, sexual abuse, uh, mm -hmm. child abuse, uh, yep. neglect. So maybe that should, so I'm, I'm just saying include, but not limited, bullying prevention, effort suicide prevention, abuse and neglect. Yep. So are we for the most part, with the, the addition, what did you say? Abuse also? and neglect. Okay. Came from Jim. 
Wondering about adding another item because the legislature didn't increase the funding for mental health pilot, and maybe this is a funding thing, but I think we ought to ask them to increase the funding for the mental health pilots so more schools can participate because we know how successful that's been. We did with the funding vote. So also taking consideration, last month we also took a vote on budget recommendations, and that yeah. was we did vote on that last month to increase that funding. So all the stuff that we voted on last month, it's not listed here, but that is also but part of those. We know that mm -hmm. that's included. Mm -hmm. Well, so is some of this other stuff. But we can we make I, it make a specific statement that includes all of those things. Yeah, you could put it under if, funding, I think, or under social emotional, but okay. funding probably makes more sense. You get that thing. Yeah. Make it social emotional um, um, it just depends on how it's applied and how we're, how we're dealing with it. I'm not a big fan of SEL at all. I never have been. Um, so it depends on how it's applied and what vetted programs we're using and if they're coming, money's coming from the federal government, government to fund it or if it's a local community involvement. I'm all for local community involvement and knowing what's, what's out there, what's available to people, giving them the resources, helping within our community, private partnerships, um, is, if it's coming in, SEL coming in from the federal government, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a fan well, of Well, Michelle, this isn't about services. This is about our mental health advisory team dealing with the issues the legislature keeps bringing up. And I, and I understand that as far as uh, with, 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 the, with, the, with, the, with the bullying and, and, the, and um, suicide prevention, it depends on how it's applied to the two in, each individual student. There's, there's right. ways. When you're talking about... Um, when you're talking about suicide prevention and, and counseling in the schools and group thing, there are there are different ways that families want to handle that. Right, um, but we've already dealt with that. All this is is about that when the legislature has a problem, come to us and our mental health advisory team will try to figure out how to deal with it, okay. not actually provide services. Yeah. Okay. Like we already had a, um, a, you know, the bullying task force came up with recommendations. And we said, rather than you guys write a bill on bullying, let us deal with it. And that's all I think this is about. So it's just keeping it, yeah, as keep, an educational keep, piece, keeping it with the Kansas State Board of Education. Keep, keeping right. Keeping us in, keeping in everything in our lane, in our lane. In our lane, okay. I, and, that's, and what, that's what we're trying to do with this. Let's move on. And generally, if particularly if this is delivered in some way through the school district itself, the... Uh, legislature really kind of delegates that um, responsibility kind of to the state board. But even if they don't, I th I've never ever seen the, the legislature not be concerned about community involvement and and uh, parental involvement, so on. So I think that's something that normally is included in in things like that. So um, the intent is to be helpful, not um, not being. Um, Putting yourself where maybe you don't belong, so to speak. Yeah. So everybody in health agreement on the social emotional stuff. Health and safety issues. Health and safety issues. I think we can cruise through some of these. These are the flavor ban and the 21 tobacco. We discussed it yesterday. The stop arm is back on there because they have yet to do anything about it. Uh, and then it's supporting human trafficking uh, work for the Attorney General's office, the opioid. Uh, and the juvenile justice, and I skipped over the vision. I, the vision was added. It was a bill that came up last year after talking with John Harding, uh, superintendent at School for the Blind. Um, this was something that needs updating big time. It's adding a, a, what is a, vision, a, a vision screening advisory board, or it's updating vision screening um, across the state. It hasn't been updated in a long time. Did you have something, Betty? Actually, I have a question because, and it's asking more for directions. Mm -hmm. um, we had discussed an item, and 
it could fa fall under health and safety. It could fall under funding. So you might direct me uh, when to ask that question, which was on transportation. Um, and we had talked about adding that to our um, agenda. So which, how would, I, how would I go about doing that? Do I wait for funding, or is that something that I would say the transportation piece would fall more under funding because okay. it's a funding issue. Okay, okay. I'll um, wait. Thank you. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. funding is where okay. mm -hmm. it would be. Yeah. So I'd, with that list, a lot of those things for, for you guys' benefit are all committees that we sit on as boards. I know we have, we affectionately call it the drug lady. I think it's you, isn't it, Dina? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I'm the drug lady. Yeah. Um, in terms of that. Um, and so they're just committees and you know, we support that their work, uh, we partner with them. So that's generally where that list comes from. And with the exception of the vision screening, I believe it all was on the list last year as well, yep. so. Okay, uh, going on to funding issues. Um, it's a lot of the stuff that we voted on last month. It's, it's doing the Supreme Court level, Bay State aid. Uh, supporting public funds going to public schools, that statement. Uh, moving to the funding of the 92% excess cost for SPED, which we voted on and approved last month. Um, it's in, uh, coordination investment in CTE programs, including the CTE transportation, again, voted on last month. Uh, and early childhood and kindergarten readiness, which again, we voted on with a budget recommendation last month in terms of that. There were a couple other things that have come up uh, that I know we have talked about and uh, put under here from from SPED, and I I need more clarifications from um, from Bert, and we will talk more with Bert on this. But there was uh, Sam, you said about a tuition waiver for those that are doing um, for SPED teachers in exchange for a certain length of service uh, that they must do in order to get it. It's to get those. A lot of the SPED jobs require a master's degree. Uh, and it's covering that extra little bit, but I have not had a chance to talk with Bert more, and I don't know if, Jim, if you know more on it, because uh, it came from SEAC. Uh, yes, there's, uh, it's not necessarily a master's degree, it's the hours that are uh, equivalent to a degree. Yeah. But yes, it's about that many. And yes, the supports are very much needed to encourage, well, because there's a, of the shortage yeah. that is in this, the special education area. So this is this is the uh, huge uh, um, assistance and incentive for people to move forward that they don't have to pay. Yeah. Um, so that that came from SEAC, and as I re if you recall from our presentation, I think, or is it this? That's no, from earlier this year. Talk about the teacher shortage. About half of them come from SPED. Um, as you recall, as I recall from our meeting, about half the vacancies in the state of Kansas teaching it come from SPED. So. Um, that, that's a big issue. One that the chair has brought up is uh, state salaries um, as well. Yeah, I'm, I have a conflict. I'm conflicted here. Because um, mm -hmm. I've just talked about staying in our lane. Uh, I'm also conflicted with uh, the fact is if we have at some point, I think we need, not today, uh, today we need to do what, exactly what we're doing, I think, but at some point, I think we need to prioritize our list because if we have four or five issues that we're really pushing, we may be able, it's, it's sort of like, uh, you know, if, if I'm given a list uh, of 20 things to do, just a list, you know, that, that's going to be overwhelming, and I'm probably not going to get anything done. But if I'm given a list of 20 things to do and say these three are the most important, then I'm going to prioritize those three and get them done. Uh, so I'm, I'm concerned about if we just present 30 things to the legislature, uh, that's going to damage our focus. Uh, and I may not even be making sense, which wouldn't be the first time. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but that's sort of, you know, I... I Everything we've talked about is important, but 
are some more important than others, and are we diluting our message by adding too much? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know the answer to that. I'm just at, just bringing that up. Yeah. I was bringing it. I was gonna say, I think you might be right. I mean, we a long list like this is helpful for these guys, so they don't have to come back every time and say, "What's your will on this issue?" But in terms of what we actually send to the legislature, it ought to be a short list. And these, this will be the backup for you. We, need, we all need to agree on all this stuff. But then just send to the legislature the things we really, really want. I'm just bringing it up because it was brought up to me. Okay. Well, I and I think when you're dealing with uh, salaries of the state employees, you're, there are classifications for people and doesn't matter where you work, what department you work in, if you have, if you're in that classification, you receive that remuneration. So it wouldn't be just our employees, it would encompass everyone, well, unless strongly. we made some sort of a, unless the legislature made some sort of an exception. I feel strongly that we need to value people that work for us, uh, absolutely, and let them know that we value them, whether or not that's our place to, to influence salaries for all state employees, even though I'm the one that brought it up. Uh, I'm not sure that we can say to the legislature, you stay in your lane whenever we jump out of ours. That's, again, mm. I, I'm one person in this group. <laughs> Sure. Yep. Same boat as everybody else. Betty. Okay. Uh, I guess this is where I jump in. Uh, it's, it's several things associated with the comments that I'm about to make. One of the things that came up in uh, a local board meeting I attended in Derby was that um, since um, under the pandemic, I guess all students get it to eat free or whatever. Um, and so we have... Um, there was elementary students that have to walk to school in the dark in order to be there for breakfast, which was a huge concern. Uh, no sidewalks, no having to cross four lanes of traffic to get to school to eat, some, eat breakfast. Um, and the concern was because um, students were falling less than the 2.5 miles, they had to walk in order to do this. Uh, one of the parents brought up it was a third grader that uh, is walking in the dark, uh, which is a huge concern. So again, I bring back the issue of, of transportation um, and the 2.5 I've been particularly concerned as it has to do with the elementary students uh, being out at that hour. Also associated with that, I understand that the legislature has a cap set on the transportation. So that would also be a part of what I'm asking us to look at. Um, I don't know, um, at the Derby School Board meeting, they do not have a hazardous route set up, transportation, uh, because clearly um, the kid that's walking across four lanes of traffic would qualify or no sidewalks would qualify. So I, is this the area then that I would make the request? We did discuss that at um, um, a board meeting that this could be included in our priorities. Is this where I would make that suggestion? Yes, that this, is, that on? this yeah. is where it would need to go. Then do I just simply say, are we gonna add transportation or, or is there a certain format I need to say this in because this is huge for me? It's feedback from the board. Well, and I do know that there's always been a concern of how this would affect a um, rural district because of the that's why I funding the cap. Uh, the cap. That's why I mentioned the cap. Because there's generally a pot, right. and right. it's distributed, right. if I remember correctly. And I had even thought, and I talked, in fact, 
to uh, Craig this morning about exceptions, making exceptions for specifically for children that are uh, having to cross busy highways, no, no, so, no sidewalks, that sort of thing. And um, then you get into who's going to monitor that and how, how many people will start saying me too okay, I, and I, so on and so forth. So that's, that and, and is always a concern. I, I appreciate what but, you're saying, but I don't believe that we have the right to sacrifice uh, students because it might impact on, on the transportation for the rural district. I was asking for us to look at that in combination, look at the cap, see what, what can be requested on that, but also understand that there are students within the urban area that require our attention as well. And when you have a, a, a third grader or second grader that's walking in um, areas where there's no sidewalk, having to cross four lanes of traffic, um, and I am told that if they walked an extra six blocks, they, there's a, a traffic control um, um, signal. There are some factors that warrant our consideration, and it was discussed at um, uh, last month, I believe, mm, yes. that we would add transportation to the priority. Mm. So I am asking that would, we do that. Would a request wording be appropriate to where if we lower the mileage reimbursement, lower from 2.5, that we suspend the cap for that right. one year right. to adjust that increase. Um, and so rural districts aren't financially at a loss because there's less money to go around. And that's why I mm -hmm. said, why don't we make yeah. exceptions for students that have this, that live in the areas such as you're describing? Because I too think we don't, we cannot sacrifice our life simply because we've got a funding idea that maybe doesn't accommodate that. So I'm looking for solutions that do not uh, impede upon somebody else's funding that they need from a rural area so we don't have a rural versus urban issue that we focus on kids and the fact that they need to get to school safely right. and, and and that's that's what i'd like to see in mm -hmm. fact that was on the list and we decided maybe we shouldn't have it on I think, here. I think with the, with the wording so. of if, if mileage is lowered, the cap needs to be suspended for a year to accommodate that extra. Uh, the other thing that came up as a request from partners is removing Fort Leavenworth from the capital improvement formula. It's for bond and interest state aid. That came from partners as well. And I know it's not typed down there, but that was one of those well, that got added. The fact is that whether you live in a rural area or an urban area, two and a half miles too long for a kid to walk to school. Well, yeah, I think that the rural areas would like that. I mean, I are walking in a ditch. Well, in in Shawnee Heights, we bus every kid. I mean, it's a rural district. There's no safe place, even if you live a block away, to walk because you're going to be in the road with the buses. So we bus every kid at our own expense because it's just a smart thing to do. So I think even rural school districts would appreciate having that mileage. Yeah. So and we did the same thing. We as long as. Bus, if, if, if we brought in buses full in the area where I was, we'd start at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, so we had, so buses did not come in full because we still started at 6.30. And so we picked up kids as long as there's room on the bus. And if it was a block from school, that's what happened. So that, you know, a lot of schools are doing it anyway. Uh, I don't see it as a conflict. But I do believe that it's, it needs to be addressed. So would you all like to see a statement 
about transportation. Yes. Okay. The cat. And the cat. Um, it may be find a solution. We need to find a solution to this issue yep. with transportation. Yep. Um, the the last thing is is on capital improvement. There's a formula and it's all prorated and um, and it's a request from some of our educational partners to to team with to support them in a statement that's saying remove Fort Leavenworth School District because again they don't have a lot of taxable property because uh, the state formula in terms of matching for bond and interest is based off of that and every year that didn't, Fort Leavenworth's not getting much richer because it's all federal property. Uh, and then it's just supporting them to remove Fort Leavenworth from bond and interest formula. Is there any objections to adding that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Once again, once so, again, at some point we need to prioritize our yeah. list down because we're putting a lot of stuff on yep. here. Yeah. That, that's we, the end of my list. We need so. To prioritize. Jean. And I, I just wanted to go back to the transportation um, issue. I. I agree that it probably should be lowered if possible, but I also believe that this is a district responsibility. Districts are capable right now of picking up any students that they choose to pick up. They're also capable of adjusting start times for schools so that students are not walking in the dark. So I think this is something districts share responsibility for because even if we lower it to a half a mile, there's still gonna be students walking in the dark um, in dangerous situations. I think districts need to take some uh, responsibility for ensuring their students are safe. I need everybody okay with the funding? Sir, A lot of it's stuff that we voted on last month anyway. So. Anything additional? Let's move on. Right. Okay. Meeting student needs on the other on the back side. Um, it's talking about public private partnerships with business we added with business to clarify uh, and et cetera. It could be organizations also for the purpose of meeting student needs. So it didn't look like we were um, supporting private schools and uh, supports funding, finding, in other words, funding of uh, private schools. Oh. Um, then the second one is finding the solution for the liability issues for workplace learning opportunities for students. And the third one requiring the State Board of Education, well, we already have to monitor the success of the foster child report card that was passed last year. So um, we want the legislature to join us in any of the requirements to um, monitor that's the success of that, post, of that report card. Are we okay with all of those? Anything to be added? Okay, moving on to changes to curricular standards and high school graduation requirements, including other governance concerns. The support the constitutional authority given to the state board to determine statewide curricular standards and to determine high school graduation requirements. And then we have a statement that asks that instead of infringing on those responsibilities, that the legislature seek to work with the state board of education. And for their information, we talked about computer science and financial literacy have been addressed within the confines of the school day and a committee is studying the current graduation requirements. This is similar to my first statement uh, about tone uh, and so I'm uncomfortable 
with instead of infringing on those responsibilities. I think that's just a tone issue. I mean, I think the message is clear that we want our responsibility and we want to, we want cooperation that it's the tone of that statement that I think may not be in our best interest. So you'd like the word cooperation? I would like infringing that part of it taken out. I mean, that's what it is, but I think tone is important. And I don't want to dominate this, folks. If you have an opinion, say it. And I, I just had a question about what confines of the school day. I'm not sure that is real clear. I think you could just, um, that they've been addressed and a committee is studying current graduation requirements. And I like Jim's change too. I, personally, I would just eliminate everything after the first sentence. I think the first sentence says it all and we don't need any of the rest of it. So you'd like for us to, to delete everything other than the sentence, the first sentence? I think that's adequate to express our concerns about that. I think that's pretty much what we had in the, um, well, last year. And we saw both computers, well, we saw financial literacy and the civics be placed on in bills, the legislature. So um, perhaps we can reword some of that so it doesn't sound quite as as uh, strike as negative. Yeah, I, I, well, I appreciate where Jane is coming from. I, I really do. I think that we have to explicitly call out computer science, financial literacy, and civics because we can't have folks thinking that we're not teaching civics. I mean, civics is already uh, uh, there. Our standards. Yeah, and, and maybe this isn't, obviously you don't want to try to include all of the standards in the document, <laughs> right? But we know that these are, I think that it's important to address the issues that came up last mm -hmm. session and the issues that may come back this session. If, if you want to um, include those, could you put um, determine statewide curricular standards to include but not limited to computer science, financial literacy? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's it's all in one yeah, sentence that is a good as an example. Yep. Mm -hmm. Anything else on the first bullet point? Okay, the second bullet point uh, has to do with the Kansas State X School High School Activities Association, also known as CASIA. And um, we have a little bit of oversight over some of the CASIA rules and policies, so uh, we're just asking that they work with us in regard of, the, of those before they take action by writing bills ex, 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 mm -hmm. and so forth. Once again, tone is important. Yeah. I, so what about putting the period after the word association? I just did that. Based on the conversation we were having, I was about ready to suggest that. <laughs> And then the third bullet, um, the responsibility of the state board to Same license, thing. and it should say pre-K through 12 educators, and ask again that they work and with the- I think we'll cut that the, section. We'll just put a period after educators. Right. Okay. Right. Based on the feedback Same from you guys, thing. so. Yeah. Okay. Because we've said that already. Yeah. 
one, at so. least once or twice. Mm -hmm. We can't hear you, Ann. I'm sorry, does that mean we need to change to the title of that section? I mean, are we really talking about changes? Are we talking about... Um, I see what you're saying. We're really talking about who's in charge. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, Polly, just uh, I'd suggest maybe just curricular standards, high school graduation requirements, and teacher licensure. Would that work? Mm -hmm. Or you could just call it governance issues. I think governance. So. Okay. I mean, yeah. we don't want to list out every darn thing they might want to if stick. If we would in. just say. That it was governance, yep. period. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or that we say it State Board of Ed governance. Uh, I just say governance. Well, yeah. I know it's shorter, but it also yeah. tells them whose yeah. governance. Okay, you guys come up with that. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> Disaster issues. So with disaster um, statutes that include flexibility when responding to natural disasters, including the, um, in other words, being able to adjust statutes to include more flexibility when responding to natural disasters. Which is directly related to the first thing that we asked mm -hmm. Craig to talk about today. I think we need more flexibility. Mm -hmm. I think schools need more flexibility. And then supporting the work of the ESSER task force, and we'll put in the, the correct total name, the commissioner's uh, task force on ESSER funding, or I'm not sure exactly what, we didn't know exactly what it was when we wrote it, but um, anyway, we'll seek that exact term out as, because the legislature has attempted to take control of, of some of the funding that was supposed to go to school districts and they could use for COVID reasons. They wanted to redirect it for some of their funding ideas. So. Yeah. You know, I know they tried to do that, but I think we pretty well shut them down. And if they didn't get the message last session, I mean, I don't think we need to put it in their face again. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think we have that authority, I and I don't know that we need yeah. to say that. Yeah, I think. We've, we've taken. Yeah. Except we're, there's we're uh, that was S or two, and there's S or three. I now know, but the same too, rules apply. So. The feds gave us the authority. If they try to diddle in it, we'll send them another letter reminding them they can't diddle in it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's kind of like rubbing in their face. Yeah, I agree I take with that. Ann. One out as well. I Put agree. that down. I agree with Ann publicly. Mm -hmm. And I agree. <laughs> so eliminate the second bullet point. So in other words, you'd I like mean, to just, yeah, we're just remove that. You know, okay. Janet and I are on that committee. We'll just continue to do what we're supposed to out do. Out of sight, out of mind? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So maybe they won't remember there's an answer three. Well, they will, but we'll, <laughs> they still, will. we'll still deal with it. <laughs> local authority. And then, right, local authority um, or support of them to select curriculum. Do we want to limit it to curriculum? I think that we need to just support support the authority of local boards of education. Right. Okay. Period after that. Is Mark Thomas still back there? Yep. What do you think? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> to what? That's the shortest statement I've ever heard you give, Mark. Call Ripley, believe it or not. Didn't come with including or <laughs> Yeah. Yep. So well, they have a lot of areas they ought to have control over, like whether or not kids mask and all that stuff. So, and we could, it could be a very long list if you wanted to go down that road. I think it was inserted to address the civics conversation because the civics bill was aimed toward curriculum more than it was 
anything else. Well, there's all sorts of that. Right, but, but yeah. they've diddled in local board authority in a yeah. lot of areas. Yeah, no. in terms of that. So anyway, yeah. any additions to that one? If not, I think, first of all, thank you. And Mr. Chair, we kept it at an hour. Well, so I, want to, and I want to say that I want to thank you and thank the board for this. We have now a long list that's unmanageable. Yeah. Uh, and so now, and, and for what we need, we've got what we need for this purpose. Now, we need to have another agenda item next month to, to prioritize so we can, so we can say these are the things that are most important because you can't spend your time on 30 things. You've got to spend your time on, I mean, um, I mean, I mean if I were going to do it, the stop arm thing to me is critical. Uh, it's something like that, but but that's just me. Uh, we need to identify those things that are most important, uh, so that you, mm. so we're all not deflecting our time to do thirty things. Um, Mr. Chair, um, I think first step is next month we need to approve this list, and I, I don't know that we need to whittle this list because these, the legislation comes up and we provide testimony on these issues, and you know how that works over yeah. there, and this helps us know when when we need to opine and when not to opine you have what you need for tomorrow when you meet with a other legislators. yes we do uh, okay well and it's something mm -hmm. we can say the mm -hmm. state board supports this mm -hmm. and it gives oh, there are so mm -hmm. many times that we really were saying the state board hasn't taken this up this mm -hmm. up information or this idea up and so we don't know where all the members stand so we had to testify neutral and this would give us an opportunity to testify in favor of or yeah. in opposition, opposition. Of. and that's another subject i think yep. at some point we need to discuss whether or not we should testify neutral at all I mean, that's 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 an that's that's a discussion for another time. But, yeah, uh, Janet. I just wanted to I, I just ask. I think I know the answer, but I want you to respond to this. I'm assuming this is fluid. That you will be back to us when the legislature convenes, and maybe something we haven't even thought of will come up, and you will come get our opinion. If we have that kind of turnaround, yeah. because mm -hmm. time-wise. Things come up in a week's time, and we only meet twice a month. So we'll like, we'll keep you informed. But um, as far as being able to say, do you support or oppose this? We may not be able to specifically say that well, I would say without I would like a vote. Of I would like to know that if something came up that's pretty crucial, that we could call a special board meeting. This, necessary this, to this once session. it's voted on next month, as as an action item, this is a living document, as I as I'm understanding from the chair, this is a living document that we can remove and or add as needed. And we yes. have, during the legislative session, we have a legislate on the, every agenda. We can adjust this at any time, and mm -hmm. to the extent possible. And I understand there are time constraints. To the extent possible, yeah. we need to take action. We, again, we're just developing it today. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I want to thank so. you uh, for, for your efforts. I uh, thank for the board for their patience. Uh, and we will reconvene at 1045. And we thank all of you.
This conversation is the result of a request for future agenda item, the National Council of Teacher Quality, information about that. And we have Michelle Miller and uh, Dr. Ginsburg from KU <laughs> presenting to us today. So welcome, Michelle. And uh, as I said, we don't usually see you on Wednesdays, but this is an exception. And so we look forward to this presentation. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Porter, members of the board, De Deputy Commissioner Nguyen-Swander. We are excited to be here today to, prevent, to present to you some information from the National Council on Teacher Quality. And I'm going to share the stage this morning with Dr. Ginsburg, Dean of the School of Education and Human Sciences at the University of Kansas. Today I got the right university. My apologies for yesterday's misstep on introductions. So uh, I'll provide you some background information and then let Dr. Ginsburg go into some deeper detail and of course stand for questions at the end of the presentation. So the National Council on Teacher Quality, on their website, they promote themselves as a not-for-profit research policy organization. Their intention is to help states, district teacher preparation programs, ensure teacher quality. Founded in 2000, they use a self-created grading system to assign a letter grade to each university teacher preparation program across our nation. The data that they collect is uh, publicly available. They work to round up course syllabi, course information, et cetera. As a sidebar, I have heard from candidates on school uh, grounds at preparation programs that will tell me, strangely enough, they get these requests just out of the blue to provide a course syllabus to this person or that person. The data requests are made from uh, two state agencies, testing companies, universities, and their determining factor, what they're looking for is pass rates, uh, number of attempts, and best attempt data. These requests, as you all are well aware, are made each year and usually several times throughout the year. Recently, we filled a request. However, that request was filled on a previous assessment for our elementary candidates. We no longer use that particular assessment, but the data they collected was necessary. But depending on the year range of data they wanted, that was on our older assessment. So most recent data you have received is not on our current assessment for elementary candidates particularly. They create their own in-house standards, rubrics, programs, uh, information for these states. They review the standards. They, they tend to look at program diversity, clinical practice, et cetera. And they, again, create their own in-house rubrics and assign letter grades for each particular standard that they are looking at. And these analytics on those uh, assessments and data gathering opportunities are performed in-house as well. Again, as I said, the data our input is several different kinds of things. The requests are made each year. And um, at this time, because this affects most fully our university preparation programs, um, I've asked Dr. Ginsburg to speak to you all today and ask and answer any questions that you all may have. I'll turn it over to him. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, let me start by saying I appreciate all your service. Uh, it's been a hard year for everyone, but I don't know how many times you've all been pat on the back for the work you've done, and uh, probably the opposite, I, I would guess. Uh, so thank you for, for all of us in the state of Kansas. Um, I, I do want to uh, comment that I did um, uh, uh, contact the other regents deans and shared the information that I'll be talking about with you. So I'm. I'm not really just talking uh, for Rick or KU, I'm talking uh, on behalf of the, of the region's deans. Um, NCTQ is a group that, that started off somewhat controversially. Um, they've been around a while now. Um, I want you to know that my ratings at KU are really high. I, they may be the highest in the state, I don't know that, but uh, it's not like I'm coming here with a bone to pick because of, of, of that, although the irony from us is on the ratings we get from them, the one area that we're weakest on, they, they gave us an A-plus and wanted to give us an award, which we found rather rather strange. I um, uh, actually was asked by them last year to serve on a, an advisory committee about, a, not about the ratings scheme, but about another system that they were, uh, uh, something that they want to look at about the use of content tests, and I did do that as an advisory capacity. And years ago, I served as a consultant to the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Education, 
got reviewing rating systems like that. So I've had some chance to, uh, to, to look at, in some depth at what it is that they do, and uh, we'll share some information uh, about that if it's okay. Um, as Michelle stated, uh, they, all, they use input variables and not outcome variables. Uh, there's some controversy in that, and, in, in, uh, and it is what they do, and I'll get at that each year. Again, uh, they do make uh, requests of us each year, as well as of the state. Um, um, you might not categorize what they do uh, as research, but for those of us at the university, data collection processes like this, we would consider research. And one of the, one of the uh, canons of research is you allow people to voluntarily participate, not force them. And uh, uh, they go into a forcing kind of thing. They typically, if you don't submit information that they request, then again, it's syllabi and it's, uh, it's course catalogs and things like that. Uh, that. Much of it they can get off websites, sometimes they can't. They file lawsuits, the Freedom of Information uh, lawsuits to universities all over the country to get this, which makes it a non-voluntary uh, kind of thing. And sometimes there'll be gaps I, I submit in uh, what they get and what they don't get. Um, uh, the biggest concern that I would have for you, I really wish, and I've said this to them both directly and uh, behind the scenes and publicly, that if they spent more time validating their standards and rubrics uh, rather than just applying them the way they do, I think we, they would have a better qual quality product. Um, there was an assessment done by faculty members uh, on the behest of the state of North Carolina, probably a body like yours, although I don't know that, um, uh, uh, to look at uh, 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 NCTQ's uh, key standards and to try to determine if they uh, were, uh, were identifying the schools that uh, the graduates of schools that made a difference in their classrooms. Here are their findings. With our data analyses, we do not find strong relationships between the performance of teacher prep program graduates and NCTQ's overall ratings or just meeting NCTQ's standards. The lead author said, if teacher prep programs focus attention and resources on meeting standards to raise their ratings, their efforts should pay off in terms of better teachers and more demonstrated student learning meeting many of NCTQ standards does not appear to lead to higher performing teachers. Um, that is part of the reason that universities around the country, many of us uh, were skeptical and this became controversial. I did an analysis uh, years ago uh, looking at their state policy rankings. They also rank states and give ratings on that. And what I did is I looked at uh, NAEP scores and the states that they rated highest and the states they rated lowest, and for the most part, there was an inverse relationship. States they rated highest weren't doing very well on NAEP, but the states they rated lowest, sometimes really high. We were rated uh, kind of in the middle on a NAEP, we do pretty, pretty well compared to the states in the country. Um, uh, in, a, in addition to that, and this is perhaps the most severe crit criticism that uh, I think me and my colleagues would have, is that they rely on input variables, and these things aren't particularly nuanced. Um, so, for example, uh, they look at HCT scores as one of their selectivity criteria. And, uh, you know, ACT is getting pretty controversial. KU is dropping the ACT as a requirement to get in. And, indeed, they're dropping ACT scores. They're going to um, GPA as the basis for student scholarships going forward. I'm almost certain K-State will do that, and my guess is all the other universities in this state and this region will do that as well. Many states have. The University of Chicago, for example, dropped that. The entire state of, of California dropped that. This remains a standard, and perhaps they'll change with, with this. Uh, uh, another example, uh, this was the bugaboo that I had, and uh, some of my colleagues said it as well. They, uh, you know, we assign uh, cooperating teachers uh, to work with our candidates. Well, one of the things, uh, that NCTQ requires is that we select those individuals. No district in this state will allow us to do that. We are told to, to come up the criteria and the superintendent or the HR office selects it based on, on the, their needs as well as, and their availability as well as ours. Now we don't go and train them and we say, here's the qualities that we want. All of us get marked down in this state uh, on their uh, uh, clinical 
uh, a, a teaching part of uh, their criteria because we don't do what we're not allowed to do and frankly wouldn't do anyway. I would never tell a state that I have to, uh, the district, this is who I have to have. That's not my role to do that, nor would I want them to do that to me. But similarly to that, they require a minimum of four visits by, uh, by the clinical supervisor who's hired by the university to the cooperating teacher and the student that we, we pay. I don't know what's magic about the number four, but from my perspective, it's not the number of visits that you make, it's the quality of the visits that you make. And as an example, at KU, we require what we call practicum, which is student teaching the fall semester, which is eight weeks, and then we require 16 weeks of student teaching the second semester. We teach two visits to, in the fall and three visits in the spring across this 20 some odd weeks. We got a C plus in our ranking on clinical supervision because they said we didn't do four, four visits. And I said, we did five. Yeah, but you didn't do it in one semester. Uh, okay, I'm, that's the frustration that you'll find that my university colleagues have. Uh, it, uh, one of my colleague deans said they were very frustrated because they provide, they got marked down in the classroom management uh, uh, standard, uh, and I don't know what the specific uh, criterion was below that because uh, they weren't, uh, didn't uh, do classroom management the way that they, they set it up that you should, and they went back and explained that, look, we require a whole classroom management course prior to student teaching, and then they go and they said, no, it has to be during the student teaching uh, experience, and so they get marked down for that. Now, I, I wasn't a part of that conversation. But that's, it's the, that kind of uh, rigidity. Um, one of the bigger problems that we have is, the, is we don't think the data collection, the collection is robust because they never include input of our faculty, input of our students, input of our graduates, or input of our employers, much like our accreditation system does here. I, I liken it to, and I, I use this uh, tongue in cheek uh, later on, it's kind of like um, uh, uh, judging the restaurant by reading the menu. So they look at syllabi, and they'll look at what we put on, on, on websites, and I'm not gonna tell you that everything there is in a pearl of wisdom and golden, but you really find out about a program by talking to the people that are involved in the program, the faculty, you talk to the students, you talk to our graduates, you talk to our employers. When we had our accreditation visit, even though it was online this past uh, uh, spring semester, uh, we had a, uh, uh, multiple people that we chose randomly from the districts that we work with that were on several um, uh, Zoom conversations with them, and we're not a part of those conversations, we're out. And they get an earful there. Uh, hope, from our perspective, uh, hopefully it was positive, we did really well in our review. They do the same thing with students, they do the same thing with faculty, et cetera, et cetera. You're not getting that in this kind of review, so it's less robust than what we all require um, uh, uh, on accreditation. Um, again, uh, in summary, input variables, it's not terribly robust, and uh, again, judging the quality of a restaurant by reading the menu. Uh, our state, I think we're lucky. We partner with uh, an accrediting agency, it's CAPE, Council for, uh, I don't remember what CAPE all stands for. There are uh, uh, eight standards, you can see them here. The data collection that goes on for, for this is incredibly robust and time consuming. Um, we report every year. One of the standards is, is quality, a quality assurance system and continuous improvement. Every single year, we have to report back to them and display on our dashboards, on our websites, what, what, uh, uh, data on all of these things and what we're doing to improve with those data. So what our accreditation agency has done over the course of the years is force us or those of us who in the past weren't constantly looking at data and making adjustments based on that data. That is the most significant criterion that our accreditor, I think, has set up. Others of these are somewhat similar to what our colleagues at NCTQ are doing. Um, again, we report yearly uh, our standards. These are the, on the standards, here they are. Um, I'll let you just take a look at those uh, uh, briefly. Again, the key one I would have suggest to you is probably the fourth and the fifth where we focus on program impact and on quality assurance. Some states don't make available uh, standardized test data. Our state doesn't uh, because of privacy concerns. And uh, we could argue whether that's a good idea or a bad idea. But in lieu of that, what each of the institutions is asked to do is go directly to districts and get data from them or to set up research studies where we will have our, our students teach lessons, will we'll, 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 uh, collect uh, 
free data on how the students are performing on the topic and then have to report on the outcomes of, the, of our student teachers in their classrooms. Really, really robust stuff. It has to have high levels of validity and reliability, otherwise our accreditor won't accept it. There's a whole book that explains how you get to high levels of validity and reliability on that. The point that I'm trying to get at is that the institutions in this state put a lot of time and energy and resources into looking at themselves, into collecting data, and, to, and reporting back to our accreditor and to anybody in the public that wants to see those data, how we're doing on these, all of these uh, standards, which are, again, are a little bit uh, uh, broader than uh, the ones that NCT Key uses. Um, again, we get reviewed every seven years. Um, uh, our state, as a partner state, means that uh, the, uh, um, Michelle's uh, office and uh, people associated with her office and others do the curriculum review. That's a part of our accreditation. Uh, there are a number of committees that review that. It's made up of K-12 teachers, academics, and uh, people from the community, which is also true of the review teams on all of our accreditation visits. It's, 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 they, get, they have to get trained to do it. it. The training is intense. Again, it's rather robust and gives us better data and better outcomes than I think the kind of cursory kinds of things that I think NCTQ does. Um, uh, I'll, I'll close with that, and uh, I, I can answer more questions about our, our accreditation. Uh, um, a part of the mandate of our accreditor is that uh, they review their standards every year, and they look at all the reviews and make sure that the reviews by the accreditation teams uh, are capturing the idea of program impact and continuous improvement that I, that I mentioned. Um, and again, that, that's a group that works in conjunction with the states that are partnered with our accreditor. So with that, let me stop and see what questions that you have, might have for Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the hand waving thing apparently is working now. I report that to the board. <laughs> what is the funding source for national water teacher quality? Yeah. Uh, we didn't put this in the slides, but I'm going to say it. They're a self-anointed national center for teacher quality. Uh, they, uh, uh, the uh, founder is a ver very, very sharp woman uh, who had uh, some ideas about some things that she wanted to do, and she got outside funding from foundations. So it's foundation support. Okay, thank you. Anne. Um, thank you, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I was trying to, and I don't know why this is, but I was trying to look at the NCTQ data on my laptop and it comes scrambled or blocked mm -hmm. because of KSDE. So if we're really interested in it, we might have that unblocked so we can really look at what they're doing. But um, if we don't like what they do, which is fine, how do we measure whether or not we're producing quality teachers? Well, I, I would say that's what the accreditation uh, system is all about. And, and we ch can choose to a credit or not accredited institutions based on the outcomes and after their reviews uh, you get um, uh, um, uh, areas for improvement what we call the AFIs and they so might. institutions that are struggling in certain areas get an opportunity to uh, make improvements if they're when the review is done if there are too many areas for improvement or there's or there's something that's even a more uh, egregious in that the accreditation can be pulled away. You're talking about the accreditation of the right. universities. Right. Uh, the, well, the teacher preparation programs, yes. And who accredits that? Is that the... That's the state. The state does that in, in, in partnership with this national professional accreditor called CAPE. Well, I remember seeing like we had Newman come through to reapprove their teacher prep program, mm -hmm. but I didn't realize that was an accreditation. Yes, yes, that's the piece I wanted to try to clarify today. So currently our teacher prep programs in Kansas are accredited by a national organization and also the state, Dr. Catherine Schmidling's work. It's a partnership. They, our state accreditation follows that national accreditation status as well. I believe all of our Board of Regents schools choose both. Some of our smaller universities choose one or the other and not both. One particular university that you've seen just recently had several areas for improvement, and I know there were some concerns about that. Mm -hmm. There were no stipulations. So the areas for improvement are issues that that 
particular university addresses over the course of the next year, you've asked for a report and we'll report that back to you. Had there been stipulations, that's the house is on fire. And so that's a, a, a moment in time that really needs to be addressed. NCTQ is not an accrediting body. Right. They are simply trying to determine teacher quality based mm -hmm. on teacher preparation. Dr. Watson and I have talked multiple times about the fact that those are newbies. Those educators, when they're finished at KUK mm -hmm. State, wherever, are new to the profession. Our, our school systems need to pick up the ball there, carry on um, determining teacher quality on this very narrow set of standards that NCTQ uses uh, m might be it, it is seen as a very narrow set of, of so uh, criteria. Did, did our state team or the national team come up with that list of recommendations? So they do that in partnership. We are okay. side by side with the state team. The state and the national team work the visits together. Mm -hmm. They make the, you heard Dr. Ginsburg mention the conversation that takes place. That's a partnership as well. We are right there with them in partnership through the whole process. Okay. Well, I noticed one of the things that NCTQ likes to focus on is pass rate of that test. Yes. And we have an institution that only has a 29% pass rate. Did we re-accredit them? I'd have to go back and look at that institution and that particular prep program to know. Because I know we can look at, like, you know, they said you might have a nice state average, but you have individual institutions where the the students are not able to pass that test or they have to take it. I mean, when we accredit, are we looking at, like, how many times did a student from this institution have to take the test, like, three times or... The accreditors will look at all of those data as well. Bear, bear in mind, professional accreditation is voluntary. The state allows us to give licenses or not give licenses, so the coin of the realm is what the State Department and, and, your, and the board does. Um, most universities uh, tie into uh, national accreditation as well. Um, you know, I, I would tell you pass rates is a nuanced thing as well. First of all, there's not an iota of evidence anywhere that, pass, that, that passing a test makes you a good teacher. Zero data, none. The test companies don't do predictive validity, and therefore uh, um, uh, relying solely on that as a criterion can be problematic. Well, I, I don't think anybody's saying that would be solely it, but, but, but it does, what is the whole list of right. things? And we can, I can get this from you later, but yeah, I'm yeah, interested yeah, okay. is what is it the accreditation team looks at? What measures do they look at? Like NCTQ, like you said, looks at, um, well, you have this group of teachers come out, and then so many years later, here's how the kids scored on NAEP. And they think that says something about whether or not you produce quality the, teachers. The way, the NCTQ does not look at any outcome measures, zero. NCTQ does not. Oh, I thought you said they were no, looking no, at No, 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 no. They don't okay. look at all of their input variables are input variables. Do we look at outcome we, measures? We, did, we were required by our accreditor to look at, at, at impact on student learning. Okay. We do have to report pass rates. We have to do report pass rates uh, by a, a series of demographic variables. Mm -hmm. We have to report pass rates by number of times that the students have to take the test, et cetera, et cetera. And those data, I believe, are on our uh, dashboards that every university has to put up on its website. Uh -huh. And only one other question. Yes. Um, do, in our um, tests that they have to take, are they broken out by core area of study or are they all together? Because I noticed in one of the comments was we don't measure each area of study, like math, English, whatever. But we do now. That's we why, do now? That's why okay. I mentioned that difference in the test. Okay. It used to be combined, and they're broken out now by subject and content yeah. area. And I know they yeah. had a real problem with how we taught reading, but yeah. hopefully that's fixed now, yes. too. Yes. So. One of the dilemmas that we have, and this is not a shot at NCTQ or, or accreditation, one of the dilemmas that we have is that um, many institutions will have, especially uh, many of the privates that are smaller, will have very small numbers. Uh -huh. Of people, so if you report a pass, they won't report a pass rate on. I think it has to be at least ten. Mm -hmm. Is that the right? Mm -hmm. So right. if you have three graduates, there's no pass rate right. reported, and yeah, that that encompasses a lot of smaller institutions. Well, I noticed they had uh, note that we had quite a few institutions that didn't have at least ten students of color either, so right. Right. weren't able to, right. to look at that. But I'll get with Michelle later about those criteria yeah. Yeah. they're looking at. I appreciate your work on this; yeah. it's yeah. helpful. And again, Thank you, Mr. Uh, look. Uh, ratings schemes have their place. I mean, uh, we play the ratings games, but it's, uh, you know, I, I'm going to put my money on something that is, is more robust and looks at a greater array of data and is much more nuanced in how they, how they assess things. They don't just 
you know, plug you with grades uh, on things. Um, uh, many of our institutions are uh, reluctant to participate with NCTQ, and that's just. Yeah, Just I think, in, you know, yeah. we, we get rated on a lot of, by a lot of different groups, too, and there's two or three of them I wouldn't, you know, yeah. wouldn't walk across the street to read. Right. But there's a kernel of truth in a lot of stuff, and we need to read it, I think, and say, well, you know, is this something we need to be paying fair. attention to, like our reading program? And yeah. we did. Right. So. I think that's fair, but I, uh, and all I would say is that, uh, is that there's no data that they would report that wouldn't be captured in, in the data that the state and, and the accreditor is, is, is collecting as well. Yeah. Michelle. Thank you, Chairman Porter. So yeah, so yeah look, just looking at, looking, um, looking at this, um, uh, the National Council on Teacher Quality, it is a think tank out of this DC. Um, and uh, some of the founders, you know, the Gates Foundation, Walton Foundation, Winthrop and Rockefeller, just to name a few, there's many, many more. Mm -hmm. um, and effective, when we look at the term effective, I'd say how is this term, uh, how is this defined? What data points must be present to um, pronounce that something is effective? And, and, and that's where I'm, I'm going with, with you, agreeing with you on that is, is um, if, 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 if it's local and if, if, it's, and if, it's, if it's a community-based thing or state thing or local thing, um, the think tank coming out of D.C. is not going to be probably what we... Right. What I would what I would agree with anyway. So right. Um, right. I would have to agree with many of your points you're making today. I'm I was just trying to figure out. Uh, I need to compare now that CA the, the other mm -hmm. accreditation thing. I, I have to look into that a little bit more. But I agree with many of your points that you made today right. with with this organization. Thank you. You know, you know I, when I was involved with them last spring, they were they, uh, a year ago. They were just and they put out a report on this recently about the. Uh, about the importance of passage rates on stand, on on tests, kind of what the what board member Wall was talking about earlier, and I kept trying to say, look, just be more nuanced in this. That 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 um, there's there's the content tests, and there's something that the, the the great experts talk about, which is is known as content pedagogy, and the tests don't capture that. And so, for example, some of the best teaching in the world in in the world. Might come from people who aren't necessarily the greatest mathematicians. Uh, indeed, the experts in cognitive science talk about what they call the expert blind spot. So think about your kids in college that are with a Nobel laureate in math who can't teach a kid who's struggling because can't imagine what it's like to struggle, right? And so that you need somebody that uh, that can can somehow relate to that. I'm not saying that Nobel laureates can't relate to that. They probably wouldn't. And uh, it's one of the problems that we have on, on things that I think are less nuanced, as you say, at a distance. You know, whether they just start coming out and, and doing some more things, uh, you know, perhaps it would be more like accreditation. I don't know what the need for that would be. Again, what they do is they assign grades and they publish it. And, you know, it's like anything. It's like uh, our rating systems for football or basketball or our universities are all rated by U.S. News and World Report. They're, 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 they're tied in with with that kind of approach to things. So you're just giving us information to look into, to, to the, for the public to look into this a little bit. Yeah, well, and, I, all, and all I would suggest to, to you is that uh, we are required by the accreditor and required by the state to make available the information uh, uh, around the, the state standards and the accreditor standards. You can go to any of our websites. It has to be there. If it's not, they lose their accreditation. So yeah. parents, students, they, they have options to, to take a look at this. My, my biggest things were uh, with, uh, with anything coming out of D.C. or a think tank coming out of D.C. Right. I don't want attitudes and beliefs necessarily right. to change kids. When kids walk into the school, I want them to have the tools to right. learn, to the read, the write, the arithmetic, the right. moving right. into the math concepts, right. all of that. But the basic foundations first so that they have the ability right. to discern between what's fiction, what's not fiction. And... Those are the things. I don't want attitudes and beliefs. And I feel like some of the things like NAEP and things like that, those scores don't, to me, do, do not mean anything because it, it's, it's, not, it's not basing, do you, can you read? Can you Well, that's all, all NAEP does. Is, NAEP has nothing to do with attitudes. No, no, but I'm thinking, I'm, I'm just thinking as far as like the push, as far as like from, from these groups and that. Right, right, right. What are they, what, I, I guess, what the, what's, their, what's their point or their purpose right. is what I'm trying to get at. It's like... What the, the, they should be focused on can the children can the children read right. and and can they can they write and do arithmetic right. and, right. and 
grammar, all of, all of that's very important rather than going in and trying to get cha change in the attitude or belief of a child. More, it's more based on respect and manners, and that, that's, that's, that's my point, what I'm trying so to So what Dr. Ginsburg is not telling you all is he has worked closely with this organization to help them understand the very things you're mentioning for a long time. Okay. And, and he's, he's um, well versed at working with them, trying to help them understand some of these things. And to the earlier point about uh, there's a kernel of truth in data, that is true, but this is the same kind of data that we're already collecting for our accreditation at system at the state level in partnership with the national organization. And that's what I love about Kansas. I have great relationship in my office with the, with the higher ed universities and with that organization. And it is a more personal personalized opportunity and not from someone coming from someplace else telling us how we should treat educators and educator prep programs. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think I heard you correctly and I've heard this before uh, and I just need to confirm if I, if I heard right. There is no correlation between passing the teacher preparation test and quality later not on. It's just the testing companies don't study that. Okay. So it's what we call in the business predictive validity. Predict validity is, is that a high score on this meets some outcome. And in this case, you would think good teaching performance. Now, it's intuitive to their defense. Uh, it's intuitive that uh, having strong content w would help make you a good teacher. I don't think anybody would challenge that. What I'm telling you is the tests don't capture but it that. It is not tested. It's yeah, not yeah tested. we just don't test it. Yeah. And one other thing, going back to my question about who funds this, do the funder. To your knowledge, do the funders have an agenda? I, you know, That's a I, I, in fairness to NCTQ, I, I, some might, uh, not all of them. I mean, they've had uh, some broad, uh, somebody pointed it out, they have had some broad-based funding. And they go back to a time, you know, like, uh, I always look at teachers as low-hanging fruit. I mean, they're easy to pick on yeah. in a business that's uh, really, really complicated. It's also about 80-plus uh, percent women. They're easy to pick on in our culture. I mean, so my, all I'd suggest to you, so I'm not, this isn't being critical of NCTQ. I think they've had some broad-based funding. I don't know their funding sources now. I mean, they have a board that is more representative now than it was, I thought, at the outset. Um, but uh, I, I find them, frankly, somewhat redundant and less robust, so why pay attention to it? Okay. And? Thank you. Well, I think um, addressing the content thing is important. I know NCTQ, and I don't think we ought to blow them off because we don't like what they do. Um, I think there's some things in there we ought to pay attention to, but they, I think, focus mostly on elementary. But at high school level, we don't let somebody start a teaching certificate unless they um, pass the practice, so, so right? So I will give you just a brief anecdotal on this piece and the question about whether or not test performance relates to quality teaching. Weekly, superintendents, HR directors call me and say, Michelle, we've got a candidate who can't pass X test, Y test. They're the best teacher we've ever had. They relate to kids. They're aware of situational uh, things going on. So having that be a sole gatekeeper um, at the content level, uh, you're, you're correct. We, we require that content expertise. Elementary level, it, it, the same is true. And I, I will tell you, I've got teachers in Kansas, we do right now, who have not passed the assessment who school districts continue to employ because they're the best teachers they've ever had and because they've been well prepared by our universities. Uh, there may be test anxieties. There may be things relative to just the whole testing environment that make it difficult for that candidate to pass. But you do agree knowing content matters. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. thank you. And, and uh, in fairness to NCTQ, they do do secondary analyses also. And so the re most recent report focuses on aspects and so I, they, they do do they do. You know, look, <laughs> I've actually been doing research over the years on ranking systems. I found one a couple of years ago that ranked KU's football team four, 14th in the country. That's pretty phenomenal because we ha we've only won about eight games in the last 10 years or 12 years. So I looked at uh, what was their data that they used, and they looked at the percentage of games that you won at home versus the percentage of games that you won on the road, and the score differential between winning at home and winning on the road. And so the logarithm mathematically was very, very sound. 
It just so happened that KU every year would uh, play Lawrence High, or you know, they play these cupcake schools, and we'd beat them at home, and on the road we'd get skunked by everybody. We were ranked higher than Alabama and Clemson. We were ranked 14th, one of them was ranked uh, KU basketball in Kentucky, they did basketball and football. KU basketball and Kentucky basketball in this ranking were ranked over 100. Arguably the two most successful, they are the two most successful basketball programs in the history of college basketball in over the last 10 or 20 years. My point about this, NCTQ, I mean, they're sincere in what they're doing and, and we should honor that, as you say. Um, it's a ranking system. Yeah, ranking systems are as good as the variables. I, uh, Malcolm Gladwell wrote about a ranking system of law schools where they changed one variable. The variable was cost. So they added cost as a variable to their ranking system. Harvard and Princeton and Yale and Stanford dropped out of the rankings. Alabama, Marquette, all that, they jumped in. I'm not saying that cost is or isn't a good variable. It just gets at what these ranking systems are all about. They're very rigid. They set up what they, some criteria that they believe, and they go with that. No one's arguing against content. I mean, I agree, our accreditors agree, the state agrees, NC2 agrees, the content's really important, obviously. All I'm suggesting to you is I wouldn't rely on a rating or a ranking system. I'd rely on some kind of robust assessments to get at the things, Michelle, that you and others are talking about that we, we, we think is important. I see no further questions, so I thank you for uh, this uh, presentation. It's very you. interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that. Lunch is served. Is it, <laughs> am I allowed to say that? No, I can't say that. And I need to point out that we have a, a, a closing time, and we have not gotten there yet. So I told Rick before we started that he was standing between adjournment and lunch. Thank you very much. The, uh, there's an optional training for board members who want, to, after the lunch break, who wish to participate uh, about uh, Zoom, isn't it? So, so that's that's optional. Otherwise, uh, we are adjourned.